I'm Kyle Ginsberg. I'm in the I'm an engineer at Puppet Labs. I work on um, mostly uh, some of the core open source product, products projects like um, Puppet and Factor. A couple others that a uh, couple others that I'll be talking about shortly. Um, I'm on Twitter. I'm on IRC all the time. I love to get hit up with questions, so don't be shy. Um, but maybe today, save your questions till for the last five or ten minutes. So I've talked to um, a ton of people about C++ at Puppet Labs over the last year or two, and um, there's, a, there's a, uh, a kind of reaction I'm kind of familiar with, which is um, people just, they're not really sure what it is that we're up to. So, um, so my primary goal today is just to demythologize a little bit what we were doing with C++ at Puppet Labs. I think there's, um, yeah, just so you know what we're up to, why we're doing it, what the plans are, et cetera, et cetera. So um, after this talk, you're going to be a happy primate. That's my goal. Uh, so I like signposting a talk. So this is the quick overview of the talk. Um, I'm going to do a brief history of languages at Puppet Labs. Um, then go into why we chose C++, then what we're doing today with C++, how you can, how you can contribute, which I would love, and, um, and, then, uh, and then some wild speculation about what we might do with C++ going forward. Um, so start with a little history lesson. Um, and by the way, there's a way more interesting long history lesson that's going to go on in uh, Eric Sorensen's talk, at, I think in this room at 4 or 4.30. Um, He's been around Puppet for a really long time and has great perspective. But I'm just going to focus on some, some, uh, some language choices in, uh, in, um, in the history of Puppet Lab. So in the early, early mists of time, 10, 12 years ago, oh, thanks, that works, or not. Um, Luke is writing what will become Puppet. It's not even called Puppet yet. I think it's called Blink or something. Um, uh, and believe it or not, he's writing in Perl. Um, it's not going very well. So he's looking around for other languages. And um, wait for it. He discovers Python, little known fact. Um, uh, it didn't last long at all. <laughs> um, I found this quote in an uh, interview that Luke did a few years ago, and it really uh, it, it made me chuckle. By the way, I introduced Python at my last job, so my goal on this side is not to slag on Python at all. I actually think Python's pretty cool. Um, but it cracks me up. Uh, I, the, um, the passion in this comment uh, cracks me up, and it's a bit of a theme I want to return to, because uh, uh, yeah, people care a lot about language selection. I myself am breathtakingly practical when it comes to language selection, including, uh, yeah, I'm breathtakingly practical, but, uh, but there's a lot of passion out there. But anyway, moving, moving forward with my brief history, um, then after that five minutes with Python, uh, Luke discovered Ruby um, and uh, started developing in Ruby in earnest in 2004. Um, I've got another quote from him that I really like here, similar thing, quite, not quite as much uh, passion or energy, but uh, he wrote, I chose Ruby because it did the job the best for me during development. Um, and that's, that, that's, the, that's the theme I want to return to, is that uh, in, the, in these early days of Puppet, it was great and a fabulous choice to use Ruby because it is, um, it's so great for rapid prototyping and fast development and trying out ideas. It was, it was fabulous for that. It's a, it was a, it's a great tool for, for developers. Um, uh, so, and it, anyway, with that, Puppet, um, Puppet blossomed. I mean, Puppet doesn't get to be what it is today without um, uh, those first, you know, like 10 years of super creative work done in Ruby. Um, so this is what the, uh, this is my super simplified representation of what the um, Puppet ecosystem looked like in 2011, as far as like Puppet core internals, which is there is a master and there is an agent and by the way, when I talk about agent here, I'm going to elide agent and apply. Apply is part of what you do on an agent. It's a first class part of what an agent does. But basically, there is the same Ruby code base on the master and the agent, entirely all the same bits on both sides. Um, uh, around 2011 is when we started exploring um, Clojure. A couple years later, we started exploring C++. And now, uh, 
my highly iconified representation of what the ecosystem looks like is this. There's still a big body of Ruby code on the master, big body of Ruby code on the agent. Um, on the master side, we're starting to port some of that stuff and implement new features in um, Clojure. Um, by the way, that icon lower left is Clojure, if you don't know that. And then on the agent side, most of what I'm gonna be focusing on today is we've started implementing stuff, uh, some of the agent side stuff in, in C++. And by the way, the file names I've put there are just sort of to hint at the kind of stuff we're doing. I mean, those are actual file names, but it's just to give you a whiff of what, we're, what, what is happening on both sides. So, why C++? This is the question I get a ton. And, um, and it's often backed up with why not Insert, Go, Lua, Rust, C, Clojure, Ruby, Java, I, um, all, all totally good questions to ask. Um, so, uh, uh, so let me go into what some of our language selection criteria were. Um, uh, we, this is, not like, this is not an ordered list. It's all stuff that really matters. We sort of approached the decision holistically, looking at essentially this set of factors. Um, First up is portability. On the agent side, portability is like a hard stop, full requirement. Um, Luke had some quote I meant to write down in his keynote about heterogeneity is heterogeneity is a key feature or key attribute of Puppet. Um, Puppet agent runs on uh, you know Windows, Linux, AIX, really old AIX, um, Solaris old Solaris, network switches, et cetera, et cetera. So portability is like a key bare minimum requirement for, for any language that's gonna run on the agent. Um, and, I, and actually Ruby's decent at that. I mean, Ruby's good at that. I, I, I have some quibbles because I probably know it too well, but, um, but overall Ruby runs on a lot of things and that's, um, yeah, that's good. Um, next criteria is um, performance. Um, uh, you really, um, Performance, you know, you really can't have too much of it. But it's also kind of a weird feature because nobody says, nobody says, can you make this 5% faster? Here's my feature request, make it 5% faster. No, wait, I've got a different feature request, make it 10% faster. It sort of doesn't work like that. You wanna just, um, performance needs to be built in. Um, and, uh, and it needs to be sort of a continuous point of emphasis. And uh, so yeah, that's that's a, that's a big driver, and it's not just a it's not just a quantitative thing. I mean, it is quantifiable, but it's not just a quantif uh, uh, it, it's quantifiable thing. It, it's also qualitative in my mind. Um, like uh, the whole thirty-minute check-in, you know, by default, Puppet checks in every thirty minutes. Why thirty minutes? Is there some magic around that? No, it's just sort of like kind of what makes sense. Well, what if the thirty minutes could be three minutes? What if it could be 30 seconds? You know, I mean, if we, if we, to me at some level it's a bug that it's periodic rather than continuous. Um, and I'm not saying we're gonna make things infinitely fast with C++, but we make things a lot faster with C++, and as things get a lot faster, just some of the, the it potentially enables paradigm shifts. Um, and by the way, C++ has been a lot faster. Um, uh, like, I, um, it often, like with Factor, you know, the one thing uh, C++ project that you know we're shipping now, you know, 10x it, totally platform dependent, super platform dependent, but like 10x improvements, not at all uncommon. Uh, sort of the flip side of performance is um, footprint. Um, another quote I snipped from uh, from Luke's chat talk this morning that I really liked was that the agent must be invisible. Um, right now, the agent is not invisible. It's a pretty big hunk of code on the system you're managing. Um, and most system software, you know, think about like NTPD, most system software is just this little thing. And Puppet is not just this little thing. It's, you know, it's Ruby and a bunch of gems and uh, anyway, it's a pretty heavy footprint thing, both in terms of disk space, in terms of um, CPU usage, which is the performance thing, in terms of memory, it chews up a fair bit of system on the system that you're managing. Ideally, the agent would be completely invisible. Um, it won't be ever completely invisible, but we can kind of asymptotically approach that. Um, so low footprint, low footprint is definitely a goal. Um, another, uh, another really important aspect of language selection is what the tooling and ecosystem for the language is. Um, there's a lot of really interesting and attractive 
languages out there um, from a developer perspective. Um, but it's really imperative that we have something that has a rich ecosystem that is going to where it's uh, where there's collectively really strong tooling, there's collectively strong community, where the language is active, being developed. Um, so that's that's a that's a I I would not want to be you know the one person still developing in insert X language and whatever language we you know commit to, we knew we'd be committing to for at least years. Um, I mean, in Ruby's case, it was, you know, it hit double digit on years and will probably hit, you know, 20 years. Um, so also developer ease, um, that goes back to that quote from Luke a few minutes ago. Um, that's absolutely, you know, anything we can do to make the developers writing the code as efficient and effective as possible is, is, net, is you know, net positive. So that's a, that's a, that's a strong criteria. And, um, and then the last one I want to talk about, and I'm going to talk about that one a little bit more, is maintainable. Um, there are, um, the Puppet code base has proven to be a challenge to maintain. It's gotten really big over those 10 years of creativity. Ideas were pouring in left and right. Sometimes those ideas were not consistent with other ideas. Internal contracts within the Puppet code base are not well defined. Um, Josh had a talk in this room earlier today where he discovered, hey, the prefetch method does something. Nobody actually knew that, but it does it. Um, uh, it's really hard to maintain code that has that behavior because you don't know what you're going to break. And that's something, we, that's something we wrestle with all the time in maintaining Puppet Core is, uh, is God, is this going to break something? I don't know. Could somebody possibly be depending on this behavior? We didn't actually document it. But it does actually behave that way, you know, it, it, and it's made it it's made it challenging to move uh, move language forward. So, um, sorry, move the code base forward. So, uh, something that's going to get us into a maintainable place is is uh, is good. So now I'm going to talk about types for a minute. Um, and by the way, type is a word that's so massively overloaded. So I don't mean puppet types like types and providers. I mean like language types like. Which can be dynamic versus static, for example. So, um, and types can mean other things too. Such an awful word. We need more words. Um, uh, but dynamic typing. That's this is some of the value proposition of Ruby, which is um, you know it's a dynamically typed language, which is uh, really uh, really powerful from powerful from a developer perspective. Um, but also like the puppet. Issue tracker is littered with backtraces where Ruby dynamically found a type mismatch, um, and that goes back to that like unclear contracts in the code. Um, so, on Twitter, being what Twitter is, I found this this quote I like. I actually have no idea who this person is. Um, I don't think it's the Chris Martin in Coldplay, but he's, he wrote um, dynamic typing: the belief that you can't explain to a computer why your code works, but you can keep track of it all in your head. So. What we've found is that we, we really can't keep track of it in our head. I mean, it's just it's full stop. We can't keep track of everything that Puppet Code does in its head. So C++ is a statically typed language. That's got a lot of nice qualities. I know it's foreign for some folks, but it's got a lot of nice qualities. It does have, it, if it seems foreign to you, yes, when you're typing it, you need to type make. It's a compiled language. Um, and yes, when you type make, you will then have to fix compiler errors because you will have type made mistakes. Um, the, uh, the upside is you're fixing those errors at compile time, not, not, you know, not later in the cycle, not in test or not in acceptance test or you know, not in, uh, in the field. So um, uh, finding failures at compile time, not runtime, is, I'm going to say, is a net good thing. And then back to that, that you know, but what's easier for the developer question? Basically, I think about this as it, this trades off development speed for stability at some level, and what that um, and it would have been totally the wrong decision to wrong language to opt into ten years ago because like the development community and the user community, you know, ten years ago or even five years ago were almost the same. I mean, it was like people who are using Puppet are like hardcore super sharp early adopter types who like are rolling up their sleeves and running into the puppet code to fix stuff, N no problem. But as we're moving into a space where there's, you know, what was it, 30,000 sites using puppet and um, 
and uh, a couple dozen people maintaining sort of the, some of the puppet core stuff, it's the right trade-off to make for that couple dozen people to be uh, having to do more work up front so that all the folks in the field have something more stable. Um, uh, the last benefit, and I know I'm kind of uh, uh, probably saying the same thing three ways, but I think sometimes it's good to say things three ways, um, is it, it leads to more intelligible code. The code is documented by virtue of knowing what the types of things are. Um, that, is, that is really good. Um, and uh, what's good for C++, by the way, slight detour, what's good for C++ is, is good for Puppet. Here's a quote from Apuk, for those of you who don't know, is Eric Sorensen, the, uh, one of the first product owners at Puppet Labs. Uh, and he wrote yesterday about Puppet, not about C++, the type system is the bomb for your scars. Um, and uh, that's sort of how I feel about uh, having a statically typed language for C++. For, uh, for kind of core implementation as well. Um, and if you're writing Puppet 4 code, use the types. It's, it's, a, it's a good thing. Not Puppet types, <laughs> language types. Um, so, uh, so what are we doing with C++ today at Puppet Labs? So the first, oh, and by the way, who's running Factor 3, or who has run Factor 3? OK, there's a few people, nice. Who's running um, like PE 2015? Okay, because it's shipping with factor three. Um, uh, so um, factor three, uh, as you probably know, complete re-implementation of Ruby factor. Um, and by the way, a lot of the things, I th a lot of the things we did uh, in the course of rewriting factor from Ruby to C++, are patterns that I think we'll continue to follow or at least use as potential models as we go and port other stuff from Ruby to C++. Um, and, and this is actually one of them, is to identify a kind of a well-constrained component or hunk of functionality and re-implement that wholesale. Um, the a benefit of that is that then people can, can opt in during a transitional period, and that's what we had for actually quite a while, factor, you know, Hofstadter's law, factor th three's port took longer than we thought. But there's a window where people can opt in and, uh, and let us know what they found. Um, and then at some point there's just a switch and we, we switch over to the new thing. It's basically what we did with Future Parser too. The difference with Future Parser being behind a feature flag was that we knew there were changes that we, wanted to, that people were gonna to need to do to adopt Future Parser to move to Puppet 4, whereas with Factor, we wanted to make it seamless and invisible. So it was sort of opt-in, tell us, give us any bug reports, and then, you know, flip back. Um, but, but again, that pattern of uh, implement something, keep, keep the old and new implementations in parallel with an opt-in for the new implementation, and then flip a switch at, like, at a major version boundary is, is a good pattern. Um, also, a super, super, super important pattern that we laid down in Factor was a huge emphasis on backwards compatibility. We, um, we set ourselves the sort of arbitrary goal that 95% of modules should require zero change to run with Factor 3. Um, uh, and I can't actually, there's not really a hard and fast way to measure that, so it's, <laughs> the number itself doesn't, um, it, it, isn't one I can answer to, but the um, but that reflects kind of our intent, and, um, and and honestly, we've only really gotten a handful of bugs around factor three around modules not running with factor three, um, usually because there were there was some bit of the Ruby code base that someone was sort of treating as public API that we never intended for someone to treat as public API, and so we hadn't ported it forward when we moved from factor two to factor three. Um, I, I can only think of like two cases like that. But so huge emphasis on backwards compatibility. And what that, what that meant implementation wise was, um, as I think about it, two major things. One, factor dynamically loads Ruby. So it's, um, uh, I get questions about the mechanics of this, which is reasonable because it's a little bit funky. Um, factor, if you run factor standalone, it looks for a Ruby shared library somewhere in its path and, and loads that dynamically. And then it will, um, and then it emulates the uh, the Ruby factor DSL in C++ 
by using the, uh, that dynamically loaded Ruby. Um, and when Puppet also factor, uh, native factor ships with a very, very, very tiny shim that, um, so that Puppet can still say require factor. And basically with a, a little bit of glue code around it, all that shim does is say, is itself do a require lib factor dot so or DLL. Because you can do that. People don't know that, but you can do that in Ruby. You can require a shared object. Um, a shared object that plays by the right Ruby contracts. Um, the flip side of, uh, of um, dynamic loading, dynamically loading Ruby is what to implement. And that goes back to that question of, um, of what APIs to expose. Um, for Factor, I think we did a, a good job of figuring out what were the APIs we needed to expose because we really had pretty light breakage um, when people were opting into it. Um, and that's a pattern we will we'll want to get to when we get to um, uh, the types and providers API. That one's going to be trickier, however. Um, <laughs> but Ruby was a good way for us to get our feet wet, you know, kind of solve some of the conceptual problems without like biting off the big pieces from the get go. Um, the last thing I'll call out is that we learned with Factor was um, tool chains are tool chains are hard. So we standardized on GCC 482. Uh, particular version of Boost, one or two other libraries, um, a CMake version, et cetera. But we, we, we picked a set of tools that were current, kind of on, roughly speaking, on the day we started in the figurative day we started in 2013. Um, and uh, uh, that gave us access to C++11 features, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, and, uh, but then, we, all those platforms I talked about, AIX, Solaris, all these old Linuxes, EL4, bless your hearts, people who are still supporting EL4, um, we, uh, we needed to build the tool chain for all those platforms. And we have an awesome release engineering team. Um, we have an awesome release engineering team that has pulled off all that, that work. That's been a ton of the effort for Factor was um, getting that same tool chain across the board, across all platforms. Um, I think it's made us realize that, uh, like, a, that stuff isn't easy, but B, it is automatable, and, um, and C, we should get on some cadence about when we update that whole tool chain. Like, we don't want to be on GCC 482 for forever. It's, we'll want to bump up to something newer sometime, but you also don't want to do that like every minor release of GCC, believe you me. So, um, so you want to think about what's the right cadence, and the cadence is probably measured in, you know, like small number of years or something, I would think. Like you do, I wouldn't even want to try and do it every quarter. That just sounds like more churn than you need. Um, so that's Factor, our first big project. Um, so as we started working on, in parallel with working on Factor, we started working on other projects. And um, this was totally an object lesson to me in how fast cut, cut and paste happens. Because as soon as people started working on a second project, um, they just, we're like, oh, here's some useful stuff in Factor. I'll copy it over to my project. I'm like, no, don't do copy pasta. You will hate that. So we tried to jump on that pretty quick, and we started a project called Leatherman, which is, um, if you don't live in Portland, that might not be a live metaphor for you. But Leatherman is a, a multi-tool, like a pocket multi-tool. You can think about it as a Swiss Army knife. Um, so hopefully that makes clear what the metaphor of the Leatherman project ideas. Um, uh, and um, so Leatherman has a bunch of stuff, a bunch of utility stuff that was going to be or might plausibly want to be shared by different uh, projects. Um, uh, yeah, you, you can read this. This, I mean, um, the dynamic loading stuff this is, and loading Ruby, the second and third bullets, we know right now Factor is the only thing that does that, but we know we'll want to have that stuff in a common library. Um, a lot, a lot, a lot of what Factor and Puppet do is to shell out and execute some third-party executable. You know, that's how we run yum, or that's how we, you know, get DMI data, blah, blah, blah. So, um, uh, so we have a framework for execution. Uh, we have a C++ wrapper for libcurl. Um, so that we aren't calling, because libcurl provides only a C API. Um, logging, file utilities, all kinds of stuff. Basically, Leatherman is our, um, is our Swiss Army knife, I'll say, since it's a more active metaphor. 
um, for anything we want to have, pretty much anything we want to have shared. If something's big enough and has a unique enough function, we'll um, break it out as a separate library. But for sort of all the miscellaneous stuff, um, that, uh, that goes into Leatherman. And Leatherman is, um, is uh, is that we, we versioned it at a 0 to 0 now. There's some stuff we'd like to do to standardize it, because since we were extracting from different projects, not everybody was following the same conventions about like when to use exceptions, when to use errors, what sort of logging message structures to have. So we want to standardize that. But um, uh, yeah, that's Leatherman. Um, there's a bunch more repos. Um, the first one is kind of interesting. If you want to dabble with C++, it's a little uh, also, one of the lessons we found was people needed, it was always hard to just get started. If you want to start a new project, it's hard to just get started. So CPP project template is something, all it does is create a little tiny command line app, but it, um, but it, it uses our unit test framework, it uses CMake, it includes Leatherman. So it's a way to, way to do, you know, fork this and go, and boom, you've got a new project. Um, that's, that's been handy for getting people off the ground. The next two, PCP client and PXP agent, um, Ryan mentioned that a little bit in, um, in his keynote today, but we have this PCP, perhaps unfortunately acronymed, is Puppet Communications Protocol, PXP is Puppet Execution Protocol, but it's a new WebSocket-based, very simple messaging framework that, um, uh, that we're using. Um, that stuff was just open source recently. Horse Whisper is a command line utility. LibPuppetDB is something we started we haven't used yet. You can probably guess what it's trying to do, but no project is actually using it yet. Um, and then last um, we, uh, is CPP Hokan. We've standardized on Hokan as our config file format for the, the future. Um, uh, Hokan was originally written in Java slash Scala. We ported it to Ruby and then had the bright idea that, hey, we'd like to use that same format on, on, uh, on Agent. So we're now porting it to C++. Um, so contributing. I guess my main message, most people I talk to, about like 10% of people I talk to are like, cool, a new language. I want to play with that. So, um, but the other 90% are like, C++? I studied that a long time ago. It was, it was awful. Um, so, uh, so, so first I want to correct one or two small C++ misconceptions. It's not the C++ you studied in school. Um, I talked to a lot of people who are like, I studied it, you know, 10 years ago and I looked at your code and I didn't understand anything. So, um, we're writing to C++ 11, almost a totally different language than C++. And, and mind you, from talking to, uh, some recent college grads, sometimes the C++ you studied in school this year is 10-year-old C++. So go talk to your professor about that, please. But, um, but we're not using the C++ you studied in school. Um, for some perspective, I found this, this little graph from the, the ISO C++ uh, site kind of handy. Don't worry about the details about it. I know it's kind of an eye chart. But look at it just kind of from, from left to right. Like C++ was standardized in 1998. Essentially, nothing happened for 13 years. Um, and then, you know, the Titan awoke, and C++11 came along and added a lot of new features. They were working on C++11 for a long time, but apparently without a ton of energy. Or, I don't want to, I mean, I'm sure, the, the heart, the, I'm sure their hearts were in the best places, but, um, but, uh, but, but now they have C++14 came out three years later with a bunch of nice new features. C++17 is on track to, uh, to come out in 2017, they're really sticking to this three-year cadence. The language is getting a ton of attention. It's adding a lot of new features. It's learning a lot from language development in the last, you know, year since 1998, um, from what's gone on in Ruby and Python and um, and Go and Rust. Um, so, uh, um, so to quote Eric Sorensen again, C++ not that bad after all. Which <laughs> That's, a, that's about as high a praise as I think you get from Eric. So that's, that's like, that's, that's thumbs up. Um, still though, I, I know I, a lot of people worry about C++ sharp edges, um, uh, but the seg faults. Um, no, I get it. Um, so the way we address, uh, or, or the memory leaks, the, those are the two, the, the two that I hear about. Um, so first of all, C++ 11 helps with that in various ways. And, um, and 
Secondly, starting Greenfield C++ projects in 2013 allows you to lay down some best practices based on, on, on learnings from all those years since 1998. Um, uh, I'll, I'll just rattle through these fast, but we don't do, we never, ever, ever do bare allocations. So I mean, a lot of C++ problem, problem, a lot of C and C++ problems come from, oh, I malloc something here, and oh, did I forget to free it? Um, yes, that will cause seg faults, guarantee you. So we don't allow that. We don't do that. We use a pattern called resource acquisition as initialization, which is a wordy mouthful. Um, but um, the way I think about it in a nutshell, and it would take me another 45 minutes to talk to explain it, but the way I think about it in a nutshell is the most powerful line of code in C++ is the, the line of code at the end of a block that's the right curly brace. When that happens, when you hit the right curly brace, everything goes out of scope and, it's, and it is cleared up. So that's kind of the promise of, uh, of resource acquisition as an installation. Also, um, also a problem in a lot of uh, C and C++ code, and, and um, like this goes to like Heartbleed and stuff, is people not using, people are like, oh, I'll roll my own algorithm. How hard could it be? It's just walking a linked list. I won't screw that up. No, you, actually, you will. So, um, you, so we, like, we include, C++ comes with a really rich set of algorithms. Um, uh, I mean, there's, it's kind of insane. There's scores of them. I have to look them up when I need one, but it's probably there, what you want. Um, likewise, standard template library boost. Basically, other people have figured out most of what you want to do. Use their implementation. It's probably better than what you're going to come up with. Um, uh, so the interesting thing about all these best practices is, that, um, is, is how to enforce them. Um, and I'll say that right now, we are partially enforcing some of that with automatic tooling. Like we use lint, we set, we turn on all warnings, so we're doing everything that compiler will give us, and we turn all warnings into errors. Um, uh, we run stuff through CI. Um, the thing I'm super excited about is um, is last uh, uh, last month was um, CppCon in um, uh, which part of the community, the C++ community coming to life is now there's actually an annual conference, which is cool. Like uh, somehow, you know, I don't know what was happening for those like 13 years in the desert, but people weren't meeting to talk about it. Um, so um, there's just this new project announced, which looks really, really promising. It's called CPP Core Guidelines, and it's basically best practices. Um, it's been getting a ton of attention, um, and um, and uh, Microsoft, the new Microsoft is, is, um, is a different beast. Microsoft is, uh, so this is best practices. And the good news about this was there was like nothing in there that was surprising to us. We're like, oh, that's stuff we were doing. It's actually, plus some stuff we weren't doing, but we weren't doing anything like, you know, opposed to it. Um, uh, but also Microsoft is implementing a library, um, implementing this and tooling to enforce it. And since we're running, uh, all commits through Windows and Linux CI all the time. Um, as, uh, as soon as they release those tools next month, we'll want to play with them, and hopefully we can um, start getting like more in, uh, more enforcement for the best practices. Because right now, some of the best practices are you know our eyeballs, and anything we can do automated is better. So um, okay, so how to contribute? My lessons are: it's not so scary, really. It's not. If you want to try it. It's not so scary. Feel free to ping me on IRC. Um, we're going to be starting to, we open sourced a couple of our um, repos uh, this week. Um, also, I did, I thought this would be handy. I pushed up some Docker, it, well, so far just one Docker image that has our whole tool chain, soup to nuts, on a Docker, on a CentOS 7 image. Um, and if you've got other platforms that, uh, that are Linux based, um, that's like super, super easy to do. I think it's going to be a little while before we push the tool chains themselves out, but we can push out images. So um, that C++ project is C++ project template is a good place to start. Um, and uh, and don't be shy. Hit people up on Puppet Dev. There's a bunch of people at Puppet Labs now doing C++, and um, we love it when people ping us on uh, on IRC and ask us, you know how to fix things. Um, and we've gotten actually a fair number of community pull requests too. Uh, I was kind of pleased by how many. Um, so now I'm gonna give you like the total, 
whistle stop tour of some wild speculation about what we would do next in the agent stack, because the because factor in some ways is conceptually the easy part. Um, and I know people are like, so is the agent, you know, are you gonna have a native agent next week? No, it's not gonna be next week. I can guarantee you that. So what does the agent stack even mean? So to me, it means three things that build upon one another. First, puppet resource. Um, second, puppet agent, which uses basically the same things that puppet resource implements. And then third, puppet apply. So if we can, um, if we can implement uh, all three of those things, we'll have puppet agent stack. And yes, there's some, I mean, if you know the puppet subcommands well, you can say, what about puppet describe or something? But like conceptually, hopefully you get it. Like if we are implementing resource agent and apply, we've got an agent stack. So what are the components we would need to port to make that all native? I actually break them out into four. Um, because first is, um, the command line interface, like when you type Puppet, a bunch of things happen, and there's a bunch of ways to add subcommands to Puppet, and there's a bunch of glue so that settings are accessible to commands, and um, that's one chunk of work is to, is to re-implement that. Um, it's not sort of part of the core value prop of Puppet, but, it's, but it's, it's fundamentally necessary, and I would say like CLI UX is pretty, is pretty essential, so maybe it is part of the core value prop. But then the other, the, the second, third, and fourth ones co correspond to, like Puppet Resource is basically what is sometimes called the RAL, another lovely acronym, but it stands for the Resource ab Abstraction Layer, basically types and providers. So um, generically, um, porting the, the RAL native would be w one component. Um, the agent is the core transaction logic in some ways, that is conceptually really pretty simple. Just like walk through a directed acyclic graph and apply resources as you get there, like how hard could it be? But, um, uh, and just that bit is, is actually pretty straightforward. Um, all the hooks and for the transaction, and in addition, all the places where maybe we should have hooks that we don't, um, are where that gets kind of interesting. And, and heck, that's another place where we should probably document what our what those APIs are. Um, and then the last one um, uh, is interesting is, you know, to do puppet apply, that means we're running the puppet compiler. So that's, a, that's, a, that's another uh, component. And, and I'm, I'm, use, I'm, I'm emphasizing these as components because I think these are things we could independently pursue and then have people like opt in to individual of those components. And I think we have some, some latitude, in abstract, we have some latitude as to whether we do them, what order we do them in. Like, we could jump into just working on the command line interface stuff, or we could jump into just doing the transaction, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, uh, so once we do all that, and that's, I know all that is a bunch, but this is what I imagine, like, this is parallel to the slide I had earlier, um, except it adds, um, so basically, once we, once we do all that porting work, it's gonna take years, but this is a trajectory. We'll have all closure puppet server, all C++ puppet agent, and puppet modules will never have known anything changed. For some, for some margin of error, but like the first 90% or something, hopefully, the people who have simply followed like the Nan Dan book or something, it'll be the Ruby and Puppet code will just work. And, and, I, and I really think we can get there. I mean, we did that, we did that with Factor. Um, uh, I know the problems will be harder when you get to the Types and Providers API, but uh, I don't think they're tractable. Um, so, okay, this slide sort of says what I was just saying. Yeah, what to tackle first. Um, there's totally room for big conversation there. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, and look for some stuff to kick off on Puppet Dev. Um, Last slide, I went through all those repos I listed earlier to find people who contributed, um, uh, and a ton of people have contributed commits to all those different projects. And um, uh, yeah, I just wanna say thank you to all of them. Uh, and very last slide, that's my cat.
Questions? <laughs> Should I be scared, Igor? No. <laughs> what about the REPL? <laughs> what REPL? For puppet agent, so on the, on, yeah, on the client side, on the developer side, if you so want. Are you, are you saying like it would be nice to have a REPL? Yes. Yeah, it would be really nice to have a REPL. Um, I think that's um, actually one of the things I thought about in demoing, but it'd be too complicated, but is um, there's a C++ REPL, which is kind of crazy, but cool. It's called Kling, um, to play on Clang, I think. Um, uh, but that's not an answer to your question. Um, I think that's a great idea. I think that it would be, uh, it would be a natural thing to implement in tandem with like re-implementing, say, the compiler or re-implementing the RAL. Um, Cause you could, I could imagine for both of those things wanting a REPL. Ultimately, I'd want a REPL that would allow me to fluidly move between both the RAL and the language. But in terms of like steps, I would think like implementing a REPL for as we implement a new RAL layer would be super, super powerful. Would you like to take a guess at the, the effort in terms of FTE years that it took to port Factor uh, from Ruby over to C++? Hmm, that's a good question. So, uh, guy, that's an interesting question. I don't actually know. Because um, some of that stuff got tangled up in other efforts. Maybe... So it's been, so I, we started, let me, so let me just ad lib. So we started it probably in 2013, but for quite a while it was just, um, you know, it was a slow, it was only getting a small bit of attention. I don't know, I think the porting of the code, maybe I would say two developer years. I think all the tool chain work might have tacked on I don't know, Jeff could keep me honest, another couple developer years. Like, that was definitely more work than I think we realized it, that it was. And that's why, for example, like, I, if you were in Mike Stonkey's talk before now, like, the reason we don't have AIX agents out is supporting AIX 5 and GCC 4.8. Like, we hit more challenges there than we realized we were going to. Um, so that's mostly sunk cost, modulo the, my comment about our, it would be, I think we want to do like, on some cadence like updates, but we wouldn't be continual. But that's, to I have no data to back up any of those numbers as total speculation. I have one more. Yeah. Is there an alternative to Doxygen for doing documentation with C++? Oh, we are using Doxygen, I forgot to mention that. I mean, it's, it's really the standard, but uh, I'm not particularly a fan of it, so. Oh, I, is there I an alternative? Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that there's something better. It seems to be the main game in town. I, um, I don't actually know of anything else. That's what we're using now is Doxygen. All right, folks, thanks. <laughs>